We are here with Lori and Melanie this morning on our podcast, Fill the Fire. We hope that all can fill the fire, and thank you so much. We want everybody to feel the fire, the heavenly fire, encompassed in his love. That's right. We're here with Chad Daybell on our Feel the Fire podcast. Chad, hi. Hello. Glad to be on the podcast with you. Why don't you start with, like, your first experience with Jesus? You were, like, his friend. You were, like, talking with him. Yeah, what he did was show me some things of future events. There were major tribulations in the world. Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. If Laurie didn't either order that her children be killed or participate in what happened, you'd imagine she would she would actually be interested to know what did happen. The fact that she doesn't want to look, the fact that she doesn't want to be exposed to the foul deeds on display. Doesn't that speak to someone so used to being in denial, she can't actually face reality when it comes down to it, including her own reality? And so the judge said her presence can and should be required to ensure her due process rights and a fair trial. So in this episode, we're going to deal with some of the aspects that occurred in the courtroom, and then we're going to deal with how that applies, how that helps us understand Laurie's personality, but more particularly her psychology. Before we get to that, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do. Uh, Bear in mind, I will be in uh, Boise, Idaho from tomorrow onwards, from Wednesday onwards, uh, providing uh, on-site, in-on-location coverage of this case. So uh, look out for photos and commentary with a bit of a, um, you know, a more of a sort of a sense of immediacy than you've been used to on this channel. If you're enjoying this episode, please like, share, leave a comment. You can also hit the thanks button and let's get started. So at 1.58 p.m., Lori Vello had requested to waive her right to be present for the rest of the day. She knew what was coming. And um, she knew what the nature of the evidence uh, was going to be that was going to be shown. You were going to have a detective basically review the findings, the discoveries, the, the sort of grisly discoveries when, um, you know, when they discovered the bodies on Chad DeBell's property. And she wanted to sort of be excused from that process. And so her defense attorney, Jim Archibald, he said that her past mental health history is fragile. And so seeing the evidence in front of her might sort of upset her fragile kind of equilibrium. But the prosecution pushed back and they said there's a requirement for a defendant to attend trial and it's um, not a right, that is not a right for them to be absent. If you think about it, if you think about this case, how, for how long and for, and how often Laurie was absent, where she was somewhere else. Everyone was looking for the kids, and Laurie was off in Hawaii, and people were trying to find out what was going on. Laurie was absent. Laurie was somewhere else. And so Judge Stephen Boyce overruled the request, and Laurie Vello had to attend. And he said that her presence um, is necessary in order to assure a fair trial. She doesn't have the right to be absent. She has the right to be present, but that's not the same as the right to be absent. And so we're now going to go into some sensitive content, uh, sensitive discussion that occurred from sort of mid-afternoon onwards in Boise in the court um, at from about 2.30 p.m. onwards. Uh, the other thing uh, to mention is really this idea that um, Laurie's really fragile you know uh, she's been laughing in between she's been whispering to her attorneys in the lunch breaks and I kind of get the sense we, we'll talk about it during the live that I'm going to do late, later today uh, my last live from California but you kind of have this idea that she was more upset by the fact that somebody told her no than by the actual because I mean this was before she saw the evidence you kind of get the idea that she was more upset by being um, 
put in her place by kind of being embarrassed by being belittled then and being undermined in a way being told by a judge uh, you you can't be excused uh, that that you don't have exceptional or special rights in this case that this woman who's previously claimed to be a goddess didn't really like that and that made her emotional not the actual um remains that she's seeing but somebody actually telling her what to do some other authority some higher authority overruling her and so this is what it was all about from about 2:30 p.m. the Rexburg police detective Ray Homosolo um, what's it Homosillo um he continues his testimony he describes and um apparently there was virtually no one in court who, who wasn't emotional looking at this except perhaps Lori Vallo some people couldn't tell whether she was sleeping uh she seemed to find a position where um no one could see her face and i think that in itself is quite interesting that she's trying to conceal her face doesn't want to show emotion doesn't want to show weakness and um there were people who tweeted including an author who covered this case who said uh what what they saw was it was uh, effing horrible and it, it it sounds like it that they placed pieces of flesh and charred bone onto evidence tops and that is what we saw from the air uh the jury and the audience saw photos of bits of bones flesh and skull uh homosillo uh point, pointed with a laser to an area of the remains and said these are organs that weren't completely burned through all the way so you kind of get the idea that somebody did a really terrible job at disposing of these human remains you know what was once a beautiful young person is now bits and pieces right and so whatever they tried to do to hide these remains that they ultimately failed and and what is left is this grotesque scene you know a person reduced to you know pieces and um and so the the prosecutors then moved on to JJ Vallo's autopsy uh the jury were shown photos of JJ Vallo um he was laying on a medical examiner's table obviously within the autopsy scenario and then he was uh, unwrapped from the black plastic bags that he was buried in and so all of that seems to be an attempt to um seal the smell of decay and also perhaps evidence um as in dna um fluids and all that kind of thing that that seems to be what that is all about um jj vella was found wearing red pajamas and that really gives you a sense of this little boy um you know that is it was obviously at night when all of this happened we know that with um Gannon Stork that they found hydrocodone in his system and that is used that can cause drowsiness and so one wonders whether something like that was the case here or whether JJ was just a bed in in bed asleep when uh he was uh assaulted you know he was obviously in a position of trust where he, th- he thought he could trust the people around him anyway his arms were crossed over his torso and um everything was covered in duct tape his head was wrapped multiple times around with more duct tape same thing happened with Kaylee Anthony um and then the removal of the duct tape uncovered a white plastic bag wrapped around his head and one wonders whether that was the ultimately the murder weapon when the first layer of duct tape came off JJ appeared to have more duct tape over his mouth the then there was a children's blanket also dra- draped over his legs so when as the idea he was either watching television um you know in his pajamas but certainly this crime must have happened at night or he was uh in bed same as with uh, Gannon Stork Homosillo said that he knew this was JJ just based on um what he could see um and then the and then at at this point the jury was f- shown an actual photo of JJ's face and people started to cry you got you get the idea that Larry JJ's grandfather um wasn't perhaps had never seen this image before and he he doubled over and started crying that is when the first photo of JJ appeared 
And then for the rest of the time, he didn't look at those images. And uh, I, I can kind of understand that, but I also think it's important that when the deeds of a, of a murderer are shown, that you, that you look at them. Uh, as as grotesque as they are, because to not look at them plays into their hands where, where they don't want you to know what they did. So, you know, that is um, the way I see it. So we are now at uh, around about the 10-minute mark. I'm going to go a little bit further and go into the TCRS assessment of Laurie's psychology. I think it's very interesting that she asked for special treatment, and we're going to look at what that means. So the whole claim to be gods, you know, by Laurie and by Chad, speaks of a need or a desire for exceptionalism. Reality doesn't apply to me. It applies to you, but not to me. Because I'm a god, I'm exceptional, and you are not. I'm above you, and I'm also above the rules. It's a nice idea, but this moment today when Laurie wished to avoid being exposed to the reality of what had happened to JJ and Tyler and perhaps a reality she was connected to. She wants to transcend that. She wants to avoid that. She wants special treatment so that she doesn't need to deal with it. Well, doesn't that prove that, that she's hardly a god when the judge says no? And when the judge says no, Laurie is powerless to do or say anything about it. Do you also see that Laurie is quite a weak person? She's the only person in the building who asks to leave the building so she doesn't have to see, so that she doesn't have to face the results of the investigation. Is this posturing? Is this manipulation? Is this Laurie making an effort to make her seem somehow super sensitive or more vulnerable than she actually is? Well, is she? Is she very, a very sensitive person? And so in terms of the TCRS assessment, you know, if you look at what James Hillman, it's an American uh, psychologist, what he, he describes a basic law of human compensation where he says we are wired to find a way to make up for our perceived weaknesses. They are weaknesses not only perceived by ourselves but others as well. And so what do we do? We try to hide them. And look at what Laurie's trying to do. She's trying to leave the courtroom so no one can see her reaction, so no one can see her face, so that no one can see her connection to these children, so that no one can see either her emotion or her lack of emotion, because these are her children um, above all, right? And so she doesn't want to show weakness. And so how to conceal these weaknesses, how to make up for them. And so if our constructs are so simple, so binary, you know, in terms of strength, weakness, good, evil, where does that actually take our psychology? And this is where it's really interesting to read about the, uh, like a uh, intertextuality in terms of Jackson Pollock. Jackson Pollock is a painter that... Uh, Hillman uh, describes and he describes his weakness and how he tries to make up for it. And I'm going to sort of touch on that right now. So like most farmers, the Pollock boys shun the outhouse wherever possible. And uh, young Jackson Pollock, he often saw his brothers urinating and then they would compete to see who could reach the furthest. And because Jackson himself, he was the youngest and he was too young to compete, he would retreat. He, he didn't want to show, he didn't want to reveal that, that he uh, you know, couldn't compete in that sense. And so he would retreat to the, the outhouse. And so he wasn't old enough to make those long yellow arcs that his brother could make, right? And just think what a lifelong scar this leaves on him. Um, uh, Hillman writes that, um, quote, although the painter does not know what he is doing, every smart analytical psychobiographer does know. The later arcs, this is of Jackson Pollock, are sublimations of piss marks in the dust, piss marks that have remained in the shamed unconsciousness of the artist. The analytical psychobiographer denies what the artist himself says which is, and perhaps he cannot know the invisible source of his work. He says, um, it's 
uh, sublimating a kind of phallic competition and sibling rivalry by action painting, right? And so all of this this failure to measure up to his siblings is later uh, expressed by this painter Jackson Pollock in all of those um, little um, marks and impressions in his, his paintings when he would eventually, um, you know, become a painter. Do you see that? That he would uh, make all of those squiggles, those arcs, wriggles, curves, splotches, all of those rhythmic patterns. And what that really traces back to is a signal inferiority in childhood. Does that make sense? And so that is one very interesting and very important expression of this idea of compensating for weakness. That is how Jackson Pollock, the artist, does it. But Laurie Vallow also has her weaknesses, and how does she compensate um, for it? Well, one way is she talks a tough game, and you hear that when she's um, in the um, sort of beauty pageant, and she kind of talks a big game. She talks about herself as a ticking time bomb and 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 uh, et cetera, et cetera. But is she actually a, a strong person? Um, you know, she's got this appearance that she's attractive and that she's vivacious and that she's charming. But is she actually strong? Or does she struggle with things like focus, concentration? Do, is she a well-educated person? Does she have staying power? Is she loyal? Is she intelligent? Is she an effective player in the real world? Or what do you think? Does she know how to deal with the real world? Or does she know better how to cheat the real world? And so I'm not going to take it further than that, but we will deal with a little bit more of what happened in this case today, the sort of legal aspect in more detail. So look out for that. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you guys next time. Worker and being all those things together is not easy. So, I'm basically a ticking time bomb. <laughs>